What's up, legends? It is Thursday morning. Uh, it's time for a epic discussion about your health. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Yanni Bormeister. I've got Richard Lellies, Richie the Rig. We are head coaches of Unity Gym and the Unified Movement System, where we turn driven people just like you into strong, flexible, fit athletes. If you haven't already, make sure you've joined our UMS Movement Mastermind private Facebook group. It is free to join. And over there, you get access to our 20 minute flexibility routine for free. It's a groundbreaking mobility and flexibility routine that you can do every single day to improve your performance. You also get access to our 10 minute upper and lower body UMS warm ups, the exact warm ups our entire tribe around the world use to improve their workout effectiveness. And uh, we do a five day flexibility challenge once a month. You can work with us for free five days to get a breakthrough in your training. Uh, today, we're talking about the five best rotator cuff exercises for stronger shoulders. This is off the back of a very successful video. I've got the stats here. It was published December 9th, 2018. It's had just under 20,000 views so far. And it's a popular video. We get a lot of comments on this video. So we thought we would take it further. We would elaborate. We would bring you up to speed with our most recent uh, experience and um, education and knowledge on the topic of improving shoulder health through better rotator cuff. Uh, before we do, how are you, Rich? Great, great. It's a bit chilly here today um, and I'm wearing a singlet apparently. <laughs> so <laughs> not the best choice. I'm a bit I don't got here. skins I'm, under uh, under my t-shirt. What are you doing? I'm I'm like wearing a singlet, uh, shorts, and long woolly fleece socks to keep me warm. <laughs> um, you but, can't see oh, what's no, happening right. under the table. It, it's uh, not. I've uh, got... I can't complain. It's, it's not that cold here. Like <clears throat> when when I say cold, it's it's probably like what 18 degrees outside. So that's no, like it's Celsius. 10. Is it's it really? 10, 10 okay, degrees, maybe yeah. it is a little bit colder than I thought. Yeah. But even 10 then, degrees. Like, 10, 10 degrees here in Australia is nothing compared to what other people are enduring will have to endure uh, during their winter. So, can you see that? No, you can't. <laughs> my my yeah. damn camera. It's 10 degrees. Actually, no, I just clicked up to 13 because the sun's out and the guns are out. Uh, anyway, uh, we, um, you know, o over the course of our careers in the fitness industry, we've learned a lot about. Um, shoulder health. And trust me, this is something you don't want to get wrong. I've come from a, um, a background of compromised shoulders through pushing my body beyond its uh, breaking point and mismanaging load. And uh, my uh, dive into, you know, um, specific rotator cuff conditioning in what we call our um, prehab or general preparations phase to training came off the back of working with people like Tony Bataji. Dr. Tony Bataji and uh, the late Charles Poliquin. And that's where we, we, I was introduced to the development of uh, um, like isolated internal and external rotation for the infraspinatus and teres minor, which t th th that, um, and, and I'll explain, I'll, I'll do a deep dive into the shoulder mechanics in just a sec. Uh, but, um, you know, what I want to first preface this discussion with is that over the years, uh, our knowledge of and an understanding of how to train the shoulders properly has gone far beyond just the um, traditional sort of physio internal external rotation exercises. And um, and I, and as we've sort of learnt to understand it, we are a little bit better. And I think um, the 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 broader um, uh, knowledge around this has has sort of developed a little bit in the last decade as well. We need to. Um, uh, we now understand that we need to train the shoulder in in different environments to stimulate the rotator cuff um, properly. So you have to. And, and so um, what I mean by that is to make this a little bit more simple. You have to um, go beyond the internal and external rotation, and this is where I think a lot of physio programs fall fall over. You know, because when you go to, to, with a shoulder injury to, uh, to a lot of physiotherapists or physical therapists, they will uh, be very good at diagnosing the issue and identifying the problem and then giving you a good entry back into movement with a couple of rehab exercises. And I see this all the time. It's sort of, it's limited to internal and external rotation. 
But what people don't realize, and this is why our shoulder rehab program has been so successful and widely adopted by physiotherapists around the world uh, as their go-to program for shoulder rehab, is that when you sustain a bad shoulder injury or there becomes a, 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 you get a dysfunctional shoulder maybe through um, poor training um, uh, principles, in imbalance training, you know, if you if you overtrain one side of the joint and undertrain the backside is a very common issue that we see where we get really bad anatomical structural balance. Then um, what tends to happen is that the shoulder, in essence, kind of forgets its role. The rotator cuff forgets what it needs to do and it starts to lock everything down. And in the most extreme cases, you end up with what's referred to as a frozen shoulder syndrome where the musculature in the rotator cuff at the, at the deep in the joint gets so tense and into spasm that it, it, you, you end up not being able to move the shoulder. And we've seen, we've had quite a few people come to us to overcome that issue and we do it very successfully. Um, and we do it under, in the same way, you know, and, and our, our shoulder principles, our shoulder training principles have evolved to um, cover uh, a, a, an enormous amount of different types of injury and it works every single time because it follows this simple principle. You must, first of all, retrain the shoulder. You must retrain the inner unit um, rotator cuff to uh, localize the, uh, the glenhumeral joint properly and then retrain the scapular stabilizers to do their job too because often that's one of the causes of the uh, shoulder impingement or shoulder problem, the scapula isn't able to sit properly. Remember, the shoulder is a very versatile joint and it has you know, thousands and thousands of different positions that it can take load in. Um, and it's, it's, it's probably unlike the, the um, you know, we think of it as a ball and socket joint, but it really isn't. It, it has a very shallow uh, socket uh, and it, it, you know, it's designed for versatility and flexibility and mobility, not for stability. And it's our job to create stability when we're lifting heavy weights with the upper body. Think a bench press or a, uh, a um, overhead press, a military press. Uh, and so what we need to learn to do is, is, is localize and stabilize the scapula because the scapula, the shoulder blade is just loosely sort of um, uh, gliding around on the rib cage. And that's the back of the joint, you know, um, that creates the, the, the back half of this ball and socket joint, dare I, dare I use the terminology. So, if that's not if that's loose, then half of the joint is loose, and 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 you're not creating that stability that we need. So the very the very first thing to understand when we're coming from compromised shoulders is that you need to train the inner unit rotator cuff to be able to reduce the glide, the amount of glide that's occurring in the joint. That's the um, humerus gliding around, slipping around in the uh, in the joint, and train the the scapular stabilizers to be able to create stability for the joint so that you can then build off that foundation uh, strength in all of the big prime movers, your overhead pressing, your chin-ups, your bench pressing, your um, horizontal pulling, your bent over row movements, things like that. And so the internal external rotation provides only a very small part of that picture, but we have to we have to train uh, the, the rhomboids, we have to train the mid to lower trapezius, we have to train the uh, serratus anterior musculature. We have like, there's a whole bunch more that doesn't get hit or targeted or stimulated properly just doing inter simple internal and external rotation, IR or ER, uh, as it's often referred to. And I'm not saying that they're not uh, important exercises. They're extremely important exercises, but your training has to go beyond that if you want to cr uh, create bulletproof shoulders. So. The, 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 you know, the very first step is to sort of understand that and understand that you're, you're, you're training these two sort of separate systems. You're training the, the, um, the rotator cuff to create a stronger force coupling to reduce glide and you're training the scapular stabilizers to create that rigidity and foundation of stability so that you can build off that. Uh, from here, we need to then understand that the shoulder's rotator cuff is designed to create stability in general. And so to train it in its full spectrum, in its, its natural habitat, you have to create anti-stabilization. And, you know, we, we so you, you know, there's lots of different ways you can do that. You can do it as simply as 
going from instead of using assisted machines that are basically locked in one plane of movement, which you can see obviously have zero stability, they, they remove all instability and create the most stable um, uh, movement possible. Uh, you could go from that to a barbell and a barbell is going to be more unstable than assist, an assisted machine. Okay. Then you could go one step further and you could go from barbells to dumbbells because dumbbells are even more unstable than a barbell. And then you could go even further and you could go from a, a set of dumbbells to inverting a set of kettlebells. That's going to create even more instability. And then you could potentially uh, take it to, you know, calisthenics, um, inversion, hand balancing, pike uh, push-ups, things like that. That's going to create even more instability and more demand on the shoulders. But you see where we're getting at here. You know, if you stop at internal and external rotation and you fail to retrain the scapular stabilizers, and then you fail to train, go even further and train the shoulder in its most, um, uh, it, it, what it's designed for, its, it's natural, you know, dare I say, habitat environment, you know, um, then you're, you're not going to take it and, and create proper strong shoulders. Um, Richie, do you have anything else to add? I, I, I like to uh, listen to what you were saying. Um, Yanni, continue. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I'm just, I wasn't prepared for I'm, this. <laughs> I've, I've just had, I've just had two, uh, two, uh, very, very strong coffees. So I'm, you strap yourself in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what, if we, if we then look at, okay, what, how do we do this? How do we, how do, what are our favorite exercises for this? Uh, we have, um, you know, like, Look at the the let's 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 create you know we had Phil on the a uh, Phil from ADPT Physio uh, on the podcast yesterday and I love this analogy he said like if we've got a, a a a metaphorical ladder which is our performance that we're climbing and the first rung is the very first entry back into exercise after you've hurt your shoulder and the top rung is peak performance maybe being able to go and compete at CrossFit doing Olympic uh, snatches and clean and jerks and you know kipping pull-ups and all of the most demanding stuff for your shoulders. Every rung on that ladder is progressively overloading uh, your stimulus uh, and obviously um, uh, development, you know, exercise is a stimulus. Uh, you go and rest, recover and feed, refeed and, and your body adapts and, and grows stronger. So if the first rung is like really base level internal, external rotation, uh, the, the base level for a, a scapular stabilization exercise, we like to use like a fit ball prone scapular retraction drill that we use in our, our rehab program, which is very effective. It seems very easy, but it's, it's, it's very, very effective because what it's sort of retraining the brain to do is, okay, I've got to set the scapula in place. Then we load into an ex external rotation using very light weights in a prone or angled position. Uh, most of our, tr our tribe do it lying on a fit ball or in a, um, uh, a back extension machine. And then um, uh, from there, we do an anti state The very first entry into anti-stability is just a wall ball drill with a one, two pound uh, medicine ball. Um, and, and you're literally just creating a little bit of instability up here. We start low, we work up high. You can't actually see my hand, but you get the point. Um, and then from there, we start to introduce um, more difficult progressions of that, you know, and very quickly, we're back into dumbbell pressing, we're back into um, uh, assisted pulling exercises. So assisted pull ups or eccentric pull up, because remember, we want to get out of the naughty corner of uh, being compromised and doing specific rehab and back into like proper training as quickly as possible. When you sustain an injury, uh, whether it be like a, a grade one, two or three muscle tear, uh, there's, and there's a very big spectrum of all of those. So you can have a, you know, a, a minor tear or, or a major tear. Um, when, you, when you hurt yourself like that, or if, even if it's just in, uh, in impingement pain where the, the uh, supraspinatus is getting jammed up in the, um, uh, under the uh, shoulder blade there, and it's and it's uh, it's getting really inflamed and and on the brink of sort of breaking down and tearing, uh, uh, or it's just a general overuse injury. You can you can get like a tendon uh, tendonopathy in in one of the rotator cuff muscles. 
very, very common. Then what we want to do is we want to get back to heavy lifting as quickly as possible because the longer you abstain from heavy lifting, the weaker the whole body gets. You, you, you know, we all know when we're into strength training how quickly our strength drops off if we are away from our training. And that's the worst possible scenario because then when you reintroduce heavy lifting, you, you're even more vulnerable than you were before. So when we sustain an injury, we want to try and avoid losing strength in the rest of the body as much as humanly possible. So as we progress up these rungs on the performance ladder, we want to um, you know, re re-stimulate, retrain the, the, the basic fundamental role of the rotator cuff, uh, which is to um, uh, localize the joint through its movement and reduce joint glide so that when we're uh, when we're lifting, when we're uh, flexing our shoulder, when we're abducting our shoulder, all these different movements, extending our shoulder behind the body, like in a dipping position, we're really strong and stable. And there's, the bone isn't sliding around in the joint, hitting other structures and, and, and aggravating other um, tendons. Uh, and then we also want to make sure that we're able to maintain that rigid scapular position when we're taking immense amounts of load, like in our bench pressing, like in our handstand push-ups, like in uh, our, um, uh, you know, um, butterfly pull-ups, whatever it is that you're doing, muscle-ups, uh, we, we need to be able to create rigidity and stability in the scapula. Uh, and then once we've retrained those systems, and that shouldn't take more than, it depends on the individual and how bad the injury is, of course, but it shouldn't take more than, a, you know, maybe three to six weeks, you know? so. Usually a, cup, a few weeks on each program phase, doing it regularly enough will be, will, will be sufficient, you know? And then we wanna reintroduce um, loaded pressing, pulling uh, in, in, in both planes, horizontal and vertical, as quickly as possible, okay? And then from there, we wanna take it further and we wanna create instability in those pushing and pulling planes. And there's so many great ways you can do that. Uh, I've in the past uh, put, um, uh, uh, strength bands on a barbell uh, with uh, with kettlebells hanging from it to create instability. You can also get, I can't remember what they're called, Richard. What are they called? Like they're like bamboo barbells that actually are designed to flex and wobble with the weights. Good question. So I don't know. It creates, um, if anyone in the comments about. knows what they're called, let us know. Um, uh, there's a specific name for it and I can't for the life of me. I'm just opening up YouTube. I forgot to uh, actually check. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. They, they look like um, right barbell alternatives. Um, never used one myself, um, but I see many people using them. Yeah, there there are specific tools designed for this, and um, and I would say uh, you know ha look into it. You don't need them. You don't need them. You can get away with inverting a kettlebell, and that's going to create a great instability exercise for you. That's one of my go tos. Uh, you could, um, uh, you know, you can start to play with calisthenics. Calisthenics is a really great way. You know what? A, one of the one of the gold standard rotator cuff exercises, which so many people overlook, is just body weight hanging. If you do um, passive hanging and mm. uh, active hanging, different drills, and progress that to single arm passive and active hanging, that's a brilliant exercise for the rotator cuff. The moment you grip the bar and squeeze a bar, your rotator cuff uh, the, the, it st is stimulated and, and switches on. And then when you put yourself into that flexion position, it's, it's really making it work hard to keep your joints um, in the right place. So a very, very good, one of our favorite overlooked exercises is just hanging. So um, if, we, if we were to sort of give you our five favorites based on current research, I'd say that internal external rotation in different planes, like mostly like a Cuban rotation, because once you've got the deltoids fired up fully, then the, the like the, when you're up in this position, which is a more advanced position, and if you've got active impingement problems, then this is gonna probably make it feel pretty uncomfortable. So you have to start lower with the elbows in close to the body. But as you progress up here, once those uh, delts are fully active now, they're not going to be able to assist with the movement at all. Whereas when you're down low, it's very difficult not to get assistance from the deltoid. They, they will work every single time. And remember, when we're trying to strengthen the, the smaller rotator cuff muscles that control external rotation, like the infraspinatus and teres minor, we want to try to target those muscles as much as possible without the bigger outer unit muscles helping out. 
So they get a really great workout. So yeah, I'm a big fan of Cuban rotations with a barbell or dumbbells, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I definitely recommend progressing to that. For scapular stabilization, uh, I'm a huge fan of the trap three variations and the Powell raise variations where we're laying on our side. Uh, so there's two, uh, three really great exercises. My third, my fourth favorite would absolutely be um, uh, inverted kettlebell pressing, single arm kettlebell pressing. Uh, that's a really great anti-stability exercise that gets the whole system working in its really natural uh, environment. And then my fifth favorite is uh, definitely bodyweight hanging and different variations of bodyweight hanging. And those are exercises that just about anyone can replicate. You don't need heaps of equipment for that. And um, you know, uh, from there, of course, we want to progress on to the big bang for your buck barbell and uh, dumbbell pressing and, and pulling exercises. My most hated exercises for developing strong shoulders are any assisted machine. And I'm sure Richard will back me up on that one. And the reason yeah. is because assisted machines do not stimulate the, the, the deeper unit stability muscles at all like very little there's a the, the tiny little bit of stimulation but once you've used them for a couple of weeks it's it's basically nil you know uh, in comparison to using free weights and so i would strongly advise that you use assisted machines as finishes for your bodybuilding uh or if you're really coming from a beginner level or a compromised state uh as a way to get you started but progress beyond them as quick as possible or progress to using them as finishes at the end of your workout, just to get those last, that, 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 the last bit of volume if your goal is bodybuilding, muscular hypertrophy. Otherwise, try to get yourself onto free weights as much as possible, wherever possible, because it Remind trains me. the system better. On cable machines for like external rotation, internal rotation, I think they can be really good. They just need to be at the right sort of weight. A lot of them are, pretty damn difficult to lift even if you're on the lightest yeah. the lightest weight so yeah just it just depends on what sort of machine and like how light it goes but um they can be really helpful for um uh providing that sort of consistent um tension throughout the range of external rotation internal um but yeah other than that like machines are again <clears throat> like you said primarily for like the finishing movements or um getting enough volume in on the muscles that you're trying to uh yep. grow like you know your pecs your, your bicep uh your pecs your biceps and other parts of your body yeah i i agree and it's it's a it's a great thing to bring up because there is a fundamental difference between using resistance bands mm. and cables for your internal and external rotation uh, and that is that the ca the cable can provide or produce constant load Whereas the band is a variable load, meaning that at one point it'll be very easy and at the end point it'll be very hard. And what that has been, although it's like, if you've only got access to bands, do not take this as, oh, this makes it use useless. It's absolutely 100% better than not doing anything, okay? <laughs> but if you can get access to a good cable machine that is well serviced, meaning that they, they, they keep it oiled so that the, you don't have really bumpy and awkward resistance. And it goes to a really nice light load of, you know, one or two pounds at the base weight, then you, you, you're you going to get a constant load, which is much better for the strength curve of the muscle. Uh, the, 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 the use of bands can interfere. There's, an, uh, there's a strong argument to say that they interfere with the natural strength curve. And when they're used correctly, that's totally fine. But when they're used always, then it, 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 it produces a suboptimal result in comparison to using a cable. So, you know, I would always say, if you've got access to a gym, go and use the cables for your internal external rotation. You can also use cables for um, kneeling trap three raises, which is a great progression. Uh, and um, yeah, all of your, you know, your, your uh, isolated pec and, and delt exercises as well, if you want to. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, unlike, remember, Guys, dumbbells, kettlebells, and barbells only exert force in one direction, and that's obvious. It's it's due to physics and gravity. They exert force down. You know, I see people moving dumbbells sideways, and I laugh. The dumbbell doesn't know sideways. The dumbbell knows down or up. And so, if you want to 
contract the muscles in a, in a uh, uh, horizontal plane sideways, you need a cable or you need a band. You, you, you know, using a dumbbell or a barbell is not going to work. It's not going to exert force uh, in that direction. So, um, you know, there's limitations to what you can do with dumbbells and barbells. And that's where like, uh, if you want to do, and this is a whole nother conversation that we don't really have time for today, but we don't have any questions live. So um, uh, I'll say it, you know, doing like pec flies, I think on cables is much better than dumbbells. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do them on dumbbells, mm. but the resistance, the load is going to be um, greater. You know, you're going to have a, a bigger range of movement under load using a cable than a dumbbell, you know, because the dumbbell, you get to a point where there's diminishing returns and at the more vertical your arm becomes, it's trying to exert force downward and now you're moving it sideways. So that doesn't do much, you know. Um, uh, so the dumbbell is great for the, for the bottom range. The cable is great for the top range. And if you want to get really fancy, you do both, you know. Yeah. Uh, anything to add? Finishing comments, Richard? No, just like... Hey, everyone, smash say. the like button if you like this conversation. It does help us. It helps the channel. It's a great and easy way to support the channel. Um, and of course, subscribe if you want to learn more about training, diet, uh, mindset, and uh, everything in between. All right, shall we wrap, wrap things up? That's it. We've got to go and dive into our UMS coaching group and give them their daily dose of coaching. We've got some great videos to uh, provide technique feedback on and uh, important periodization discussion. See you guys right, tomorrow. Guys. See you then.